So yeah, just as capital accumulates at an ever accelerating pace, we're going through capital at an ever accelerating pace. So we've got nine chapters to cover in 25, 30 minutes. So uh, that's fine, whistle stop tour. So um, we've looked at um, the individual, you know, the production process, where surplus value comes from. And, and Tash went into a little bit how the capitalist starts with money. They invest that money in capital. So that, that capital uh, in the form of commodities is, uh, you know, it's the wages of the worker. They, they buy labor power, they buy machinery, they buy raw materials. It undergoes the production process and it spits out more money, which is an amount of money uh, exceeding that money that went in originally. So there's a surplus which comes out of this production process. But of course, capitalism doesn't stop there. Each end is also a beginning. Uh, each end of the capital cycle has to be the beginning of a new cycle. And we have to st step back a bit now and look at the whole process as a whole. Um, and of course, um, as Marx said, a society can no longer, uh, can no more cease to produce than it can cease to consume. And therefore, capitalist production is also a process of reproduction, and reproduction in a number of senses. Of course, we have to reproduce the next generation. We have to tr train up a new generation of workers. Uh, but it must also be the reproduction of everything which has been consumed. And Marx talks about how consumption takes place in a number of ways. The worker consumes in a dual way for a start. First of all, they consume when they're at work. They consume the commodities, the raw materials. They consume the machinery. That machinery has to be replaced. Those raw materials have to be replaced. Marx terms this productive consumption, as opposed to the consumption of the capitalist who's constantly creaming off a bit of the surplus uh, and, and, and spending it on truffles and Lamborghinis and, and cigars, as, which is very much unproductive consumption, if you like. But the... the, the so, oh, sorry, I, was that Francesca? Uh, okay. Um, and then, of course, the worker also consumes Individually, and that is, a, un, unlike the capitalist consumption, that is a key part of the, production pro the reproduction process. The, the worker must reproduce themselves and their family as workers. Um, but from the point of view of the capitalist, of course, this expenditure is something entirely incidental. To, to them, it's just a necessary thing in the same way Marx used the example of a steam engine has to be fed with coal and water to, to, to undergo its operations. A worker must be fed and clothed and so forth. But it's an incidental expense that must be minimized to the absolute minimum so as to extract the maximum profit, reduce the costs associated with production as far as possible. Um, but the capitalist production is a reproduction process in another sense. It also reproduces the social relationships. The social relations of capitalism reproduce the worker as a worker and the capitalist as a capitalist each generation. Um, and it's something that doesn't stand still. It's constantly reproducing itself. For, from the point of view of the worker, it's very simple to see. The worker in exchange for their wages, provides a certain amount of labour power. But at the, ex at the end of that process, they, they are just as propertyless. They're just as, part, as much a part of the proletariat as when they went into that. They don't acquire, at no point do they acquire commodities and capital. Uh, in fact, all of these say that they're making cars, for example. The worker never owns cars. They never come out with those commodities that they produce always belong to the capitalist. And they are therefore, individually, they have the semblance of freedom. They can open a contract with the capitalist if they like, uh, they can break that contract and they can you know, stop working for them. But when we consider the system as a whole, the working class as a whole cannot opt out from selling itself piecemeal to the capitalist class. And therefore, uh, what starts out as a process which has the semblance of equality, of equal exchanging for equal, um, turns into its opposite. It turns into a process of exploitation through the dynamics of this system. But from the point of view of the capitalist as well, um, the capitalist production process is also the reproduction of themselves as a capitalist. And Marx uses the example, say a capitalist has a million pounds worth of capital, they invest in production. And that million pounds uh, uh, of capital, uh, they, they, they buy machinery, you know, all the other goods and, 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 and the labour and so forth. Uh, and that spits out £100,000 worth of profit. Now, say they're a particularly profligate capitalist and they consume that entire £100,000 in truffles and Lamborghinis. Uh, after 10 years, they have consumed an amount of wealth equal to a million pounds, the initial capital that went in. And so all of the capital which is now circulating is the product of new labour. In other words, the worker through their, you know, through their labour has reproduced the capitalist as a capitalist. Um, uh, that none of the, no element of the old labour that was invested, the old capital that was invested, the old values, uh, 
currently exists in the market has all been consumed by the capitalists. So when you hear this, for example, you quite often hear the apologists of capitalism saying, my dad or his dad's dad and his dad's dad worked very hard to accumulate this capital and therefore we deserve to inherit that wealth and, and the benefits that come with that wealth. Actually, all of the surplus and, and, and all of the capital in circulation at a certain point is new labour that has been expended to reproduce the capitalist as a capitalist. Now, I've, I've used the example of this profligate capitalist spending all his money on truffles. Of course, in reality, they don't spend all of their money on truffles, uh, not just because that's absurd, but also because, uh, <laughs> because of course, they must plow back a certain amount of that money back into the production process. Uh, capitalist production cannot stay at the same level uh, uh, and continue um, along that same cycle of a million pounds worth of capital this year is invested in a million next year. The capitalist has to say invest 1,500,000 next year or 1,200,000 in a few years time, but 2 million eventually. They have to accumulate capital. And they do this for one reason, whatever the effects of this accumulation. There's only one motive and it's the profit motive. Of course, we've talked about that. The capitalist finds themselves in a bit of a contradiction here, don't they? They want to consume the wealth that is produced by the workers, but they also realise that they have to invest a certain portion of that back into the production process. And Marx, he mocks the capitalists actually, who, who claim that they, they, that, that they are actually um, they are abstaining from consumption, and that is why capital is invested. It's their abstention from, from consuming everything in truffles and Lamborghinis that has allowed the production process to expand. The accumulation of capital takes place, and he only does it for the good of the workers. In actual fact, Marx points out that this accumulation process is also going to pay greater profits down the line. The greater capital accumulates, the greater the profits down the line. It solves this contradiction, if you like. The pie continually gets bigger. Um, and they do it for, 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 for one reason. If they don't, they're going to be outcompeted by their fellow capitalists. And as we've explained in the, 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 the chapters on machinery and so forth, the capitalist doesn't just uh, set up factories with the same level of technique and so forth as they would have done previously. In fact, they're constantly revolutionising the process of production. And capital accumulation is a necessary element in this process of the revolutionisation of the means of, of, of the mode of production. Because for a start, you need, for example, you couldn't set up... Uh, um, an, an oil rig on the basis of £100,000 worth of capital. You would need many tens of millions of pounds worth of capital. Certain machines are so big that, of course, you require uh, an awful lot of capital to invest on, exp on, on developing new labour-saving devices. You gain all of the advantages of cooperative labour by bringing in more workers into one workplace. And so the net result is, of course, to cut to with, with this uh, increased productivity of labour to actually cheapen commodities, to outcompete your competitors, to put the small businesses out of business uh, that by the medium-sized businesses and the large businesses put out the, 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 the medium-sized businesses. There is this constant process of, if, if you like, it's either do or die. You either accumulate or you stagnate and someone else will revolutionise the, the, the mode of production and will, will cheapen their commodities and will grab your part of the market. But what is the net result of this? The net result of this is obviously the concentration of capital in fewer and fewer hands. And in fact, of course, the small fish are gobbled up by the big fish. In fact, you do see that precisely what Adam said, this process of integration when the, uh, someone in their supply chain, you know, when the small suppliers, um, uh, shopkeepers go bust, the big supermarkets take them over and so forth. There is an integration of the, of the supply chain from top to bottom. There is the, the, uh, the, 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 the buying up of capital, uh, of, of small capitals by big capitals, inorganic growth as they term it. There is this process of concentration and it happens, uh, according to Marx, by a number of mechanisms, if you like. It's not simply the, the more surplus value is added, if you like, uh, onto, onto this bigger and bigger pile of cash which is there for investment. There are other means by which the capitalist class also concentrate wealth in fewer and fewer hands um, and, and centralise wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Now, since the dawn, actually, of the capitalist epoch, you've had the phenomenon of uh, joint stock companies. In fact, Marx points, points out you would never have had railways if people had to slowly accumulate the money necessary to eventually lay out on that huge amount of capital involved in building a railway. What happens is a lot of small capitalists get together and concentrate that wealth. They centralise that wealth into a joint stock company to build the railways. The, 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 the trading companies like the East India Trading Company and so forth were lots of small capitals accumulated aggregate 
aggregated so that they could put into power a lot put into operation a larger amount of labor power carry out bigger operations and capitalism tends towards this process of not just concentrating capital as in the big capitalists put out of business the small ones but also uh, centralizing the existing capitals and other mechanisms also exist the big banks do it all the time they take lots of little bits of money from here and there small depositors the current accounts of big businesses and so forth they take all of that money and they turn it into a huge volume of capital which they can then invest in the production process on, gra on a grand scale and you get eventually with the big banks putting out of business the small banks the domination of economies by giant banks which are buying up uh, industry which are investing in industry in other words finance capital eventually and huge monopolies eventually top this pyramid of the capitalist mode of production uh, free trade gives way to monopoly production <coughs> And that is, an, that is, again, one of the contradictions. You start out with the laws of free trade, you end up with the, with the laws of monopoly, with the, uh, the, the capitalism in its, in its end phase, if you like, in this period, of huge monopolies dominating the world economy. And as a footnote to this discussion, and particularly these chapters, I highly recommend comrades read uh, Lenin's Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, where he goes into this, and Marx touches upon it briefly. Uh, or, or anticipates this domination of the economy by a few uh, huge monopolies. And when, this, when, when, uh, uh, when Lenin was writing at the start of the 20th century, the big banks in the United States, which he already described as completely dominating the, uh, the economy there, only their capital constituted about 7% of GDP. Today it is 200% of GDP. So that process that Marx predicted of increasing concentration of wealth at one end of society is, is tremendously confirmed by the con continued development and progress of capitalism. And we've heard there's about eight capitalists own the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity. There is this huge polarization. Um, and um, yeah. Um, yeah, what, is the, uh, what are the effects from the point of view of the working class, from the point of view of the, uh, the, the rest of society? Well, for, for the working class, of course, uh, uh, laying out more money in terms of capital has a, has a bit of a contradictory effect. One thing is, of course, capital, part of the capital is laid out in buying wage labour, is, is buying the labour of the working class, the labour power of the working class. And therefore, of course, to some extent, an accumulation of capital is also a growth of the proletariat, a growth of the, pro of the, of the grave diggers of the capitalist system. And therefore, precisely as Marx said, the, uh, the accumulation of wealth at one end of society is also the accumulation of poverty and misery and so forth at the bottom of society. Uh, and there are those within, uh, um, if you like, uh, reformists who see this horrible inequality and they're like, they want, they, want, they want nothing to do with it. They want inequality to be gotten away with. Um, but really, when they, if they don't look beyond the capitalist system, if they don't start talking about socialist revolution, really what they want is a tiger that eats lettuce. It's simply not in the nature of the beast to have a capitalism that doesn't accumulate huge wealth at one end of society and accumulate a mass of poverty at the other end of society. Now, from the point of view of the working class, of course, it's not simply that workers are pulled into the production process. That's one part of capitalist accumulation this constant pulling of new layers of workers into production. But then there is another aspect, because of course, precisely the reason that the capitalist is accumulating is to revolutionize production, is to in part replace the working class with newer, more expensive machinery, which overall cheapens commodities and so forth. And therefore, another section of the working class who were previously employed by this capital are now being uh, kicked out of work and uh, you, have the, uh, you have machines replacing them, of course. So another section of the working class, whilst one section is being pulled into production, another is being thrown out of uh, production. They're being thrown onto the scrap heap, into unemployment and so forth. We see the mass deindustrialization that has taken place in much of the Western world because there are cheaper, uh, cheaper laborers can be purchased in other parts of the world, in particular China and so forth. One of the big debates that is going on at the moment, of course, Part of the reason Trump was elected was to bring back jobs from China. That was his thing. It's China, you know, we're going to bring back. Yeah. Um, but there was a very, uh, there was a very um, good article. I think it was in the International Business Times that said, uh, let's suppose that by some miracle we're able to repatriate American capital to the United States. It wouldn't actually be um, American workers that would, put, would take Chinese workers' jobs. It would be American robots that would take Chinese workers' jobs. In other words, of course, the reason that the capitalist uh, lays out capital uh, is to um uh, is fundamentally to cheapen the production process that's what they're constantly looking to do and they would sooner invest in machinery than pay American standard of living for their workers, if you like, it's much uh, more cost effective. There is a corollary to that, which is what we're seeing today, 
when there, when there is this uh, constant downward pressure on wages, when workers are being paid far less than they were in the past, you actually see the stagnation of, 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 uh, of, of productivity, as it's cheaper actually to take on more workers than it is to invest in new machinery and so forth. So there is this pushing and pulling of the working class. They're being brought into production, they're being thrown out of production. <sighs> And what Marx says is there is a self-regulating mechanism within all of this to capitalism because, of course, um, the, the, the commodity labour power is subject to the same laws that all other commodities are subject to. In other words, the, the law of supply and demand. And we could imagine that if accumulation outstrips the supply of the, pop the, the population, the supply of the workforce, the size of the proletariat, basically, then eventually demand is exceeding supply. In other words, wages are going to rise on that basis. Um, but what happens if wages rise? Well, on the one hand, they can try to get rid of workers by the, you know, the, the accumulation of capital in the form of robot, robots and so forth. So capital accumulation can far outstrip actually the growth in population. Um, but on the other hand, of course, accumulation will eventually slacken. If, there is, if, if uh, the wages are beginning to rise, the paid part of the, of the working day, if you like, is increasing relative to the unpaid part. So there is this squeeze on profit. Why would the capitalist invest other than to accumulate profit? Therefore, there is this tendency towards the slackening of accumulation. There is a tendency for the growth of unemployment. And eventually, wages are pushed back down, if you like. And Marx uses this to attack some of the ideologists of the, of the capitalist system at that time, who said, if you want to understand the poverty of the working class and why there is so much unemployment, well, it's because they breed like rabbits. It's, that's the problem. It's, it's, there's, a, there's this constant uh, proliferation. They just need to... Uh, you know, stop creating more babies and new workers, basically. Um, and this was the theory of Malthus. Um, and uh, we find echoes of it today, actually. Macron, just the other day, was blaming the poverty of the, people in, of, of, the, of the people of the continent of Africa on the fact that they have too many children, uh, not to mention the vile racism of this, but this is actually something that was completely uh, uh, shattered by Marx. He explains, actually, that capitalism has its own self-regulating mechanism and the, wor the, the, the unemployed working class is a key part of capitalism. Capitalism cannot exist without unemployment. There always has to be a surplus population. In other words, constantly being thrown out of the production process, constantly creating that excess demand, uh, that, that excess supply, if you like, to therefore push down wages and always there to take up the slack if there is a sudden burst of accumulation, new workers that can be taken on. A reserve army of labour, as Marx called it. It's actually a testament to the, the deep crisis that capitalism's in. And we'll look at this later. How long are we doing? About 15 minutes? Oh, so, oh gosh. Um, it is uh, it's a testament to the, to the, to the, um, uh, the, uh, the unhealthy, the sick nature of the capitalist system, is that this unemployment is no longer a cyclical phenomenon. It's not that workers are getting laid off during uh, periods, of uh, periods of slump, although they are, and being taken back on during periods of boom, which they're very much not. What we're seeing is even though if you look at the official figure is 4.5% unemployment in Britain. I saw an interesting article in The Guardian which said that if you take into account precisely the things that we've talked about, zero hours contracts where workers are, um, are liable to be sent home before their shift, part-time workers who are not getting the hours that they want to work, uh, and other sections of workers which are um, not classed as technically unemployed but are, you know, bogusly self-employed and so forth, not necessarily appearing in those figures, it gets closer to 18%. That is a huge wastage of human potential. People that want to work and can work, but capitalism needs them to remain idle because the dynamics of the system demand it. Now, um, I think we've uh, talked enough about that. Um, yeah. So, um, we're talking about We've, we've spoken about how, if you like, capitalist uh, accumulation takes place, how it creates this surplus population. Um, but we, we're left in a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, I think, with this, uh, you need capital, or the capitalist needs capital to acquire surplus value. Um, but it is surplus value which is then ploughed back into production, which creates new capital. That is the basis of accumulation. That is how the laws regulating capitalism work. Now, what came first, the surplus value or, or, or capital? Where was that first seed capital that needed to start the ball rolling, if you like? Um, and Marx looks at this in the chapters 26 to 30-something, uh, till basically the end of the book. And uh, he says, well, it wasn't enough for a few merchants or a few savvy manufacturers to, or, or whoever else to, or misers to accumulate money. Money is not capital. Money does, is, is no more capital than, uh, than um, 
Uh, machines are, cap are inherently capital. Raw materials are not inherently capital. Money, machinery, labor power and so forth, they only become capital in the hands of the capitalist uh, when the capitalist confront, well, for a start, has a monopoly on the means of production. And by that, that also implies the opposite, that there is a large section of the population which is comp completely deprived of means of production. In other words, a section of the population has to have absolutely nothing but their ability to sell work. They need to be proletarianized. Um, and capitalism in its early epoch, towards the, end, towards the late Middle Ages, was confronted with a problem. Because the majority of the population, although there was this you know, acquisition of wealth in the towns and so forth, the majority of the population actually lived on the, on, on the countryside. L land was essentially the, t uh, the, 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 the title of, of wealth, if you like. That was what made you wealthy, was the possession of land. Going right back to antiquity, in actual fact. Uh, the, the idea of money being wealth was something new to the capitalist system, if you like. But the majority of people lived on the land. They were peasants. And for the most part, what they actually consumed was the stuff they made, the foods that they grew on their, on their garden or whatever else, uh, or on their little plot of land. It was the, the, the clothes that they were able to patch together themselves. It was the house that they built from their own bare hands. Um, and ex except for a little surplus they might have taken to the market. And of course they were exploited, viciously exploited by their feudal lords. They would have to spend half the week working on the lord's land. But they were not a market. They were not going to buy commodities because they made everything that they needed. And furthermore, they were not going to sell themselves to work for a capitalist because they made everything they needed again. In other words, uh, the, the, there had to be a process of what Marx calls primitive accumulation, which was not just the accumulation of wealth, uh, into a few hands, but the expropriation and the, uh, of the wealth of the vast majority and the expulsion of those peoples from the land. And this took place not through the natural laws of, 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 of supply and demand, which I've just talked about that happens in the normal process of accumulation uh, to regulate wages or anything, but through the most terroristic, brutal methods imaginable. Marx describes how this period of capitalism, the birth of capitalism, is, is written into the annals of history in letters of fire and blood. And he is not exaggerating. The, the, the workers, uh, well, the, the, the peasants, first of all, many of them were expelled in the, the feudal wars. He, he looked particularly at Britain because he, uh, it was the archetypal country of capitalist development. Uh, they were expelled first in the, in the feudal wars. A lot of the, 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 the workers were, uh, the, the peasants were expelled from the land. Um, then in the, uh, the Reformation, the, when the church's property was actively despoiled by the up-and-coming uh, capitalist farmers, essentially, they stole the land. Uh, the Protestant Reformation was nothing more than the interests of the bourgeois given a religious guise and the peasants again were expelled from the land they were forced off the land uh, and a lot of the lords themselves turned themselves basically into capitalists there's there was a growing market in Europe uh, particularly for wool uh, for the woolen industry uh, they, they expelled the peasants themselves and replaced them with sheep uh, there were ten sheep where one family had previously been in a lot of places and all the way down through the late Middle Ages into even into the 19th century you have uh, the clearances of the uh, uh, and the, the enclosure of the common pastures which were tilled in common by the peasantry and the clearances of the highlands and so forth and these people these people had no, no idea of where to go basically what did they do they'd been expelled from the land they were terrorized into going into the cities they were forced they were whipped they were beaten for a first offense you would have a v for vagrant marked upon your chest if you were found begging in the countryside uh, with a with an iron poker or you would have your ear clipped off so, to, so that you could be seen visually to be a vagrant. For a second offence, you could be executed, you could be thrown in prison for the rest of your life, you could even be turned into a slave. You had Parish slavery was a phenomenon in Britain all the way down into the middle of the 19th century. Um, in other words, they were terrorised, and, and most of them, first of all, manufacturing was not big enough to absorb this huge population. Uh, and second of all, the popula th these people, they had known, known nothing apart from tilling the land. Terroristic methods were used against them. Capitalism came into existence, not through economic compulsion, but through the physical compulsion of the working class. And what is true in, in Britain and in Europe, as, as a whole, is, is true to an even greater degree, an even bloodier degree, when we go into the colonial world. When we talk about the, the tens of thousands of Native Americans that were entombed, forced into slavery and entombed, uh, buried alive in the great silver mines of Potosi and other areas. Uh, the, the, the working to death 
of the native populations in the Americas, the hunting of black people for slavery in the Americas from the African continent. This primitive accumulation was the means by which, and this finally puts an end to this lie that, you know, oh, you know, the capitalists, it, they worked really hard, you know, their, their dad's dad and their dad's dad's dad so, and so forth worked really hard to acquire this property. No, it was the mass expropriation of a lot of small producers. But, uh, and this only ended towards the, when we get to the beginning of the 19th century, it only ended when the working class became conscious of itself as a class, finally began to become class conscious, finally began to organise, began to challenge the capitalist system, gained socialist consciousness, began to threaten the capitalists with their own revolutionary overthrow and their own expropriation. That is when the, finally the capitalists were forced to step back from naked oppression and let the economic forces of compulsion take part. Uh, finally were forced to allow trade unions to become legalized and so forth, when they were challenged by the, this new force, this up and coming class, the working class. But this, this is a horror story that I'm telling you, obviously, the, the story of primitive accumulation, how capitalism has its genesis. Um, but it had its progressive side, because what it did is it abolished individualized production. It abolished the small production of the peasant and the small um, artisan and so forth. And it, continue, it, it took all of the uh, productive forces in the society and it centralized them, allowing for everything we've discussed, the division of labor to, to, to be expanded, the use of machinery, all of the benefits of cooperative labor and labor carried out in common. It centralised production in fewer and fewer hands. And this process is still going on. This, uh, not just in terms of the, 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 the centralisation by the gobbling up of smaller and medium enterprises into these huge monopolies, but it is also going on in so far as uh, primitive accumulation is going on. We've talked about the mass slavery which exists, the slave markets in Libya, uh, the, 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 the debt servicing which is going on. National debt is one massive means of primitive accumulation uh, th through the means of which about two and a half trillion, the repatriation of profits and debt servicing accounts for a net flow of two and a half trillion in wealth from the underdeveloped to the, to the developed countries under modern capitalism. Um, and yet that huge centralization of wealth is laying the basis for a plan of economic production, for a newer, higher stage of society, for a socialist stage of society. And uh, uh, I think as uh, uh, Adam pointed out, we already have the elements of planning under capitalism. The, 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 big, the big corporation don't leave their internal dynamics to the market. No, they have, a, they have a clear strategy and a plan by which they plan production. And what we're talking about, and this is the essence of capital, from, the, from, the, from, primi from this primitive uh, pre-capitalist society, through the terroristic ex uh, expropriation of those people into this greater concentration of wealth, the essence is that now uh, under modern conditions, we have a huge working class. Finally, production is concentrated in a tiny number of hands, and therefore the death knell sounds for capitalism. It is time for the expropriation of the expropriators in an act which, which by comparison with the terrorism which was uh, meted on our, let's face it, our ancestors, we are the descendants from those people that were expropriated, uh, in comparison to that, the expropriation of a tiny number of eight monopoly, you know, eight billionaires. You know, we could take them, the people in this room, but you know, by comparisons with, obviously, it's not going to be us. It's going to be the organised, co class-conscious working class. But in comparison to that, the expropriation of a tiny minority by the vast majority will be a bloodless and peaceful affair if it is organised and if we are ready for it. And that is the essence of capital. That is the essence of what we're doing, uh, what we're discussing. That is the essence of what we in the international Marxist uh, uh, tendency are fighting for. The expropriation of the expropriators on, and, and the creation of a better society on the basis of the, 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 the material conditions that have been created by capitalism already pre-prepared for us.